All right, you guys, episode nine of Alone, season nine. We are getting down to it on this season. There's a lot going on, a lot of excitement. We're gonna be talking about a lot of the things that we've seen on this episode, but also specifically, we are seeing a big shift in climate happening, right? This is the freeze up episode, and that's a big deal out there. We're gonna be talking about some of the things that make the Labrador climate in particular so challenging. We're also seeing a lot of people having issues sleeping, and we're starting to see the deep hunger set in. We're gonna be talking about rationing your food versus fasting and some of the pros and cons of those approaches. And of course, we see someone go home this episode. We're gonna be talking a little bit about that and the particulars. At the end of this video, I'm also gonna be talking about hunger and some of the different types of hungers and how one experiences those psychologically and viscerally. Lots of great stuff to talk about, so let's go ahead and dive in. I love that this episode starts with a really nice view of Carrie's door. I saw it in the background in the earlier episode, and I was like, what is that thing? Is that the chimney, some kind of smoking system? What's going on there? Then she was on our Patreon call, so told us, oh, I hope we see the front of the door because it's beautiful and it's like a mosaic. And now we got to see what she's talking about. So awesome door, beautiful, and also really functional because it's adding a lot of insulation and, of course, keeping the cold air out of her shelter there. As always, Carrie's attitude is just so great. She brings so much heart to it. Always a smile, always something to laugh about it. And that is huge out there. I also love that in this time, she is talking about having eaten that muskrat and it lasting her three days, which is awesome because that seems about right. A lot of the folks talking about food and doing a lot of rationing, they're not really giving their bodies what they need. We're gonna be talking about this more when we come to Juan Pablo and his epiphany about his new strategy. But yeah, three days to eat a muskrat that was really fatty and a lot of meat, that's a little bit more reasonable. So I'm glad that she didn't skimp on it and spread it out over so long that it wasn't doing her body as much good. We see Carrie talking about how as she's gone longer out there, losing fat, losing some muscle, she is losing her ability to aim well with her bow. And I'm so with her. They've been amazing marks people, marksmen, markswomen out there. But yeah, for sure, that is a thing that happens and it totally happened to me too. They showed it in season six, me taking a shot at a snowshoe hare that wasn't that far away and missing. That is what happens after a long time out there. Please subscribe to my channel, like this video, and hit the little notifications bell if you want to know when my videos come out. And consider supporting me on Patreon. We're a wonderful big family and there's all kinds of great benefits to being part of my Patreon team. And then we see Adam talking about having barely slept the night before and what a hit it is on his system. And this is a thing that a lot of people don't know about being really hungry or being in ketosis. It really affects your sleep. It's very, very common to have poor sleep out there, not just for all of the other reasons, which are totally valid, hunger pains, the wind and the noise, anxiety, all kinds of things that can come up for you out there, but just physiologically, the state of being ketosis, which all of these people are, we all are if we're either in a fasting state or if we're not taking in much in the way of carbohydrates, it affects your sleep and there's not much you can do about that. So Adam barely getting any sleep, that is really rough on his system. He's going through several really challenging things at once, right? All of them are, but Hunger, really hard on your system. Low temperatures, big stressor on your system, especially when you don't have a way to get consistently and thoroughly warm. And then add lack of sleep on top of that. That is a whole lot of rough going on at once. So I can see where the lack of sleep is a bit of a straw that breaks a camel's back for him, right? Have to just give a shout out to what we see Adam wearing in this scene and several of the other scenes, but this lovely fuzzy, not sure if it's his buff or his scarf as an item, but it looks to me like it is hand felted alpaca fur, which makes perfect sense because I know from his background story that Adam is an alpaca shearer. So very curious to talk to him about this when he's on our next Patreon call, but I wanna hear the history of that sweet, what looks like alpaca scarf he's wearing. He's walking around and talking about the wind. And this is kind of the first that we see of that super, super intense weather that Labrador is known for. It is zoned as a cyclonic weather system, right? Like cyclones, as in tons of wind that comes from all directions and sometimes every different direction at once and is really, really tough to deal with even more so on the coast where it's much more exposed and there's less trees and you're getting the 
full blast of those winds just screaming across the Atlantic with nothing to stop them. So they're definitely feeling the effects of that inland as well. And we're really seeing that this episode. So why is Labrador so intense? Because you've got kind of the worst of all worlds as Juan Pablo has talked about. You've got both a lot of moisture and really low temperatures, which makes that low temperature feel a lot colder. And then the wind that is just driving that cold and often damp air into everything you're wearing, everything in your shelter, everything damp and just frigidly cold. Adam is walking through the brush talking about how it is just ankle breaking terrain for sure. 100%. That is a major issue most of these folks are dealing with. It is just hard country to travel in, things grabbing at you all the time. And there's two things going on there. One, it's just exhausting, right? It's really hard work to push through that stuff. And then two, as we see with Adam as well in this episode, it is really easy to trip. So as your system is winding down and you're more wobbly, you've got less recovery ability in your body, it is way easier for it to take you down and have a fall. And when you're in an already emaciated and weakened state, those falls are gonna be more problematic to you. So really common for people to see more injuries as they get weaker with a combination of this hard terrain. And we saw that with Tom in the last episode, right? Bad falls that took him out. Adam's also down to just a few arrows. It's what I was worried about in the very first episode of seeing that terrain. This is terrain that is going to swallow arrows whole. So he's already lost five out of his nine arrows. That is rough and I get it. I lost a ton of arrows in the Northwest Territories. It's a major issue out there when you only have so few arrows to start with. Juan Pablo also having a really hard time sleeping. Super common out there. And again, the wind is a really big issue. It's also the first really good look we get at Juan Pablo's shelter. We've seen it from the outside in early episodes, but now we're seeing it from the inside. And it looks to me like it's not like it's not super easy to move around in there. It looks like the main part of it is taken up by the bed and it's also got a lot of headroom. So that means that it's going to be having a lot of the air that's heated up towards the top. It's not gonna be a shelter that's gonna keep him very warm. And unlike a lot of the other folks, it doesn't look like he has any insulation. It is just bare tarp. And that is almost like being unprotected. It's protecting you from the wind, but I mean, that cold air absolutely penetrates through that tarp. So lack of insulation, definitely an issue for him. He's definitely burning more calories than he needs to because of that. Also with the windows letting light in, awesomes have light, but same, same issue. In his case though, the whole tarp is letting in as much cold as those windows are. It also looks like it might have some gaps in there because the tarp is all the way up and over and it's a lot harder to seal the edges with that type of a structure. So wondering how that's gonna be for him long-term. Really good idea for him to be airing out his bag regularly. He's talk, been, uh, talking about getting the feathers fluffed up so they're not clumping and that's important, but it's also really important to air out your sleeping bag in situations like this, because inevitably when it's that cold, you're gonna be pumping moisture from your body into your insulation in the evening when you're in it. And that's gonna be accumulating in insulation and bringing the insulative value way down. So it's gonna be bringing the our value down and it's not going to be as effective. The solution for that is airing it out regularly so that it can dry out. And once the temperatures get down 20 and below, we're starting to talk about a more dry cold. And so the air is actually going to be sucking some of the moisture back out of his bag. So really good system, really important to keep on airing out your bedding in these cold climates. I did it regularly in the Northwest Territories on season six. They never showed it, but I'm really glad they're showing it with Juan Pablo real important. I feel like this is the first episode we've really seen Timogen start to seriously suffer. Been able to see that he's getting skinnier and skinnier. This time it's showing us how much weight he's lost. And he's saying, look, I've got barely any reserves left. My fat is totally gone. And we see that it's definitely starting to affect him. He's running on fumes. He's not feeling good. And we see that this is where that other piece starts to really kick in, which is that sense of spirit and love and devotion and doing this journey for something greater than yourself. So I really like how we see this arc with Timogen of, I'm here for my family, it really matters, but this is for me. And now being like, wow, I wouldn't be doing this just for me. I've, I've reached what feels like an edge, but I'm pushing through that edge because I have loved ones I'm devoting this journey to. That's really important. 
Terry appreciating the beauty and how amazing that landscape is, being fed by something greater than herself, similar to Timogen. For her, it's the love of the place and the experience as opposed to the love of family. But Carrie's just such a bright light out there. I love seeing this, having known her for 15 plus years, getting to see her really living it up out there is awesome. The next scene of Timogen, we see him trying to burn a hole through a trunk to make his bird snare. So rather than doing it for getting a fire like we've seen before, he's doing this as a drill itself. Same basic motion, but we're seeing that he's really starting to struggle with some of his motor skills. Not surprising, right? This is a thing that happens once we get to deep hunger and he's having a hard time with it, but he is trying to make the same type of bird snare that we saw Tom doing in an earlier episode. I'm gonna say that I don't feel as good about Timogen's because you can see that that stick that he has and the hole that he made, it's, it's hard to get it out, right? He has to put some force and it seems like it's catching on the way out. The whole idea of those snares, what makes them work is having a hair trigger so that the weight of a bird is gonna trigger them. So I'm curious how this is gonna work for him. For sure, as Adam says, not having any food is a big time saver. I thought about that in the Arctic too. It's, you know, one of those situations where it is a serious bummer to not have any food. So you gotta look for the silver lining, right? You're like, hey, well, I might be starving, but at least I don't have to take time out of my day to cook breakfast. So, yep, totally get it. And it's a really important attitude to look for the positives rather than bemoan the negatives because there are always going to be a ton of hard and challenging things there. And the more energy you give to them, the harder they get. I find the scene of Adam shooting that grouse and holding it and speaking to it while it dies really poignant, really moving. I think it's so important to be present and loving with the animals that we're harvesting. And I think there's this idea that you have to be ruthless and cold hearted to be a hunter and to take an animal's life. And I think it's really the opposite. I think that the better hunters are ones who are really present with and respectful of the animal. And I think that giving an animal a good clean death and caring for it is one of the most beautiful gifts we can give a thing, right? No animals out there are dying of old age, right? They are going to die probably at the mouth of some predator that is not likely to give them a moment of calm and peace and tell them they're okay as they're dying. They're probably going to be half swallowed while still alive and struggling, right? So this is actually a beautiful thing. And I had the experience in the Northwest Territories sometimes of finding a live animal in my snare and having to club it to kill it. And I would always tell it how much I loved it as I hit it, hold it as it went through its death struggles and died. And I think that's a really beautiful and caring and deeply connective act. So thank you, Adam, for demonstrating this. I've noticed that on the show and in general, a lot of people seem to take more issue with the idea of a large animal being killed. No one seems all that upset about the squirrels and the grouse and the fish, but we've seen a lot of people upset, like when Jordan took his moose and when it was a rough killing on that muskox for sure to get hit in the, in the thigh and then stabbed, but still, people tend to have more sympathy for those larger animals and identify more with their deaths. And that's why I love that Adam points out something that I talked about in my video about Jordan's moose kill, which is it takes life to support life. And when we're taking large game, that's a lot fewer lives that we have to take. So it's so much better in a lot of senses to take a big game animal and have so much less suffering doing so much more good in our body. New socks for day 50 treat for Juan Pablo. Love it. And that thing, thanks grandma. And then the like, wow, grandma, I love these socks, right? Really cool to save little treasures for yourself, little treats to mark those special milestone days. And heck yeah, 50 days, that's a big deal. The whole frozen season was 50 days, right? Launched a lot later, so they were more challenging 50 days, but still 50 days, big freaking deal. So I love that he saved a little treat for himself to help celebrate 50 days. And yeah, fresh, clean socks that you haven't been wearing for 20 plus days out there, that is a serious cause for celebration. Physiologically, survival-wise, Juan Pablo has hit it on the head. It is definitely scientifically shown that you are better off to fast for a number of days 
and then get plenty of food for a number of days rather than to slowly ration your food where you're getting nowhere near enough food for a long stretch of time. This is something that I've talked about when we've seen people ration their food. Timogen drying those three grouse to eat them over a long time rather than mowing a grouse a day and then going without. And what Juan Pablo says is absolutely true. Your body feels hungrier getting not quite enough or far less than enough than it does actually having nothing because our metabolism shifts. We go into fast mode. That's something that our bodies know how to do and it's more comfortable to us. At the same time, when we're in a place where we have so little coming in and it's really hard on the body, psychologically sometimes a little bit to eat can feel easier on the body than nothing to eat. So I'm of two minds about it. Scientifically, physiologically, he's right, but your physiology isn't the only thing going on out there. I rationed my pemmican on season six and at the beginning I would go days without any and then eat some and then have another day without it. By the end, I was eating a little piece every day and that felt like it made a bigger difference to me. It felt right to my body to eat that way. He's saying, I'm gonna do what nobody else is gonna think to do out here, but I'm gonna trust my intuition. So his body is saying he would be better off without it. So this is a great example of letting your body call the shots when you're out there. It's your best asset, right? It's got a lot of knowledge listen to it. So there's no right or wrong way to do it. The key thing is what does your body tell you it wants and give it that. Carrie gets a squirrel. Awesome. We're not seeing a lot of people bring in food right now. So really sweet to see that. She's still roasting her game over the fire, which is like, ah, oh, dang it. I'd love to see her cook it in a pot so she's not losing because she does not have enough to lose right now. But again, Attitude is everything, right? And I'm not gonna lie, roasted tastes better than boiled all to heck. I do have a special technique for dry sauteing that I think makes it really, really good, but we can talk about that later. At any rate, <laughs> so her attitude is stellar, so I think it's making up for what she's losing from roasting her food. Timogen is talking about how he can really feel his body shifting a lot. And I think that this is important in general. Lots of us feel our bodies shifting out there, but I think the fact that Timogen is a doctor and has a deep physiological knowledge of what happens in the body, I think it's something that he is probably paying a little bit more attention to than the average person. And I love what that brings forward into this episode. And yeah, heck yeah, he doesn't have to convince us how differently he's doing in his body because I can hear it in his voice, right? His voice sounds different, a little, a little slurred. He's not enunciating so well, it's a lot slower. We can see it in his face. His face is less expressive. He's got less excitement and get up and go. We can really hear and see the struggle in Timogen. It also might be affecting his mental acuity a little bit. As a bird flies by, he says, there's that crow. It's not a crow, it's a raven. And I think that he knew it was a raven because when he was setting the trap, he talked about it as a raven, right? There actually aren't crows up there in those extreme environments. That's more raven territory. So definitely starting to have some big shifts. And yeah, when things get rough out there, being more aware of our loved ones, our ancestors, the ancestors of that place, and thinking about how did people make it out here when they didn't have the modern amenities? What do the ancestors of this place have to share with me about how to get through this hard time? We also see him with the ice. And this is a thing that's really critical, right? Freeze up is one of the most intense and dangerous times out there because right now there is enough ice to make that water inaccessible, but one inch of ice is not strong enough to walk on. So it's potentially very dangerous because we have this solid surface that's very appealing and very tempting, but the most dangerous thing you can do out there is stand on ice not thick enough to hold your weight three inches is the minimum for the average sized person. And there can still be thin spots close to the shore. It tends to be thin. It's also wherever there's currents, it's gonna be a little bit thinner. And a river like that, there's a ton of current. So it's probably gonna be really inconsistent. So somewhere like that, you'd want the ice to be thicker than the minimum. A still lake, yeah, you can maybe trust it at the minimum. Still better to be above the minimum, but a river, no freaking way. You wanna be really, really safe out there super common as we see people starting to really know that their body is winding down, that their time might be winding down, to actually check out what's going on with their body 
and we get to see it for the first time. Maybe they've been checking themselves out all along, but for myself in the Arctic, I actually wasn't looking at my body until the very end because I kind of didn't want to know, right? I felt good, so it was like, okay, I'm going to go with what I feel like because if I look, it might be scary. And it, it is scary. On the med checks, we see it, right? You have to pull up your shirt and they take photos of your belly. And the first time that you see crazy skin folds because you've lost weight so fast, it's a little terrifying and it can mess with your head. So I think it's good not to look at your body too much too soon, but it's also important to be real and realistic about what's going on there. You don't wanna just ignore your body completely. So there he is looking at it. He doesn't look quite as emaciated as some folks do, but we're also seeing that he's losing a pound a day and he doesn't have fat left to give. So it's gonna be muscle. So Adam's being wise about this but he's still trying, right? He's still resolved that a bear would turn everything around for him out there, and it would. Also, there's not a lot of bear sign. Bears are smart. Once people have really set up shop and their noises and their smell, and you know, it's affecting the foraging around there, they tend to clear out not necessarily in areas where people are common and have a lot of resources that tends to habituate bears. So they want to come and see what's for dinner, but areas where people are a rarity, really common to see bear sign early on and then have the bears be like, no way that looks dangerous. Get me out of here. So Adam kind of sees the writing on the wall and he says, you know, no one has ever thrived on small game out there. 100% true, right? The people who we've seen actually have enough food have been the few people who have gotten big game. And even those generally were having a really hard time. So on small game, it's not long-term. You can scrape by for a while, but small game in particular, rabbits and squirrels have almost no fat. And that leads to rabbit starvation. I've talked about that in these before, but you have to have fat for your body to be able to process almost pure protein. Without the fat, you're going to be building up toxins in your body and it's going to be a problem. More calories can do you more harm than good. So Adam's 100% right. Small game isn't going to do it. I'm not going to go another 20 days on minimal small game and with no body fat left. Like I talked about before, when Adam says my legs are out of gas, he's saying he's having a hard time taking every single step. And not only is that the beginning of the end, right? The signal that your body is just done and all you have left are your organs to metabolize, not good. But also, as we talked about before, just really increases your chance of injury and going out in a way you don't want to, like a bad fall, but come on, 52 days is huge. Not a lot of people on alone make it to 50 days. And he does talk about it as a failure, but I just wanna talk about this thing that we're seeing here, which is that there is a significant difference between leaving before freeze up and staying through freeze up. Visually, it's a big difference because they can't come in on boats. So they're coming in on helicopters and there's something about getting through that transition, which is such a big deal to the landscape, to the critters out there. Something substantial shifts in the landscape once freeze up happens. So I think that getting through freeze up is a really cool marker of success. It's a big deal. So kudos, Adam, you didn't stay the long term, but you stayed long enough for freeze up and you got to ride in a freaking helicopter. How cool is that? It is really cool. <laughs> Just that ride back, that's a success in my book. And this brings us to the issue that I talked about in the last episode where we saw Tom and Jesse both go out, but the idea that it is a success to walk out on your own two legs letting go of the idea that the only success is either winning or getting extracted. Getting extracted means that you are potentially doing long-term body damage, right? It is not wise. And Adam's saying, hey, I am, I am a tradesman, right? I work with my hands. My body has to support me. There's nothing that is worth putting it in jeopardy, 100%. And I believe that Making that choice for yourself is a win, is a noble thing that I wish was more celebrated in alone and amongst alone fans. And I'm seeing a shift towards that this season and I am loving it. Thank you for letting it come through the editing. Thank you, the people who are representing that. It is such an important message for people, particularly in our culture to get. No money buys back your health. Winning is not the most important thing you are and taking care of this one vessel you have been given that is fragile 
that is your most sacred task. And congratulations on your awesome win, Adam. Also, dang, that shelter, so good, right? I've had all of these toss-ups about what's the best shelter and why, but seeing it come down, it's like, dang, that is a substantial, well-built, super functional shelter. So nice. Moss House, double thumbs up, really sweet. Watching Adam leave brings me to another thing that I talked about on one of the first episodes. I thought his chimney with the waddle and daub was awesome. I was worried about it. I was worried that it might catch fire over time, that the clay might crack and the wood be exposed and catch fire. So count me wrong, he did not have a fire issue, which makes me see, hey, wait a minute. We have not seen a shelter fire this whole season, which is awesome because the majority of the seasons we have this demonstrates the degree to which if you're an alone fan and you're watching the shows and you are learning from what you see happen on past episodes, it gives you an advantage out there, right? People have learned to be really, really conscientious with fire and potential shelter fires in alone. Great job, everyone. I really hate seeing people go out through fire or have massive damage through fire. Three people on season six, my season, had major fires in their shelters. So Thank you for not doing that this season. Really love seeing Adam give that grouse some love at the very end and looking at it being like, hey friend, any other day you would have been in my cook pot, but today I get to just appreciate you. You made my life here possible and now I get to see you for all you are rather than just what you are for me. So let's talk a bit about hunger. Obviously it is a overarching theme on Alone. We see it a lot talk about it a lot we see people really feeling it and i want to talk about the fact that there are a lot of different types of hungers and it really shifts throughout the time out and what we are seeing now is a deep visceral hunger and we've seen that in some of the folks who had less body weight coming in but i feel like this is an episode where it's kind of the universal theme that everybody is in so when you first go out there you feel uncomfortably hungry right away. Your body is like, what is going on? I've just gone from eating a ton to put on weight to very, very little, no carbohydrates, lean meats. Oh my gosh. And it has a bit of a panic attack, honestly. And part of that is not actually what's going on physiologically in terms of your need for food. A lot of it is the habitual eating that we're used to doing. In our daily lives, a lot of us, particularly in the United States and other similar countries, we eat more than we need regularly. So our body is used to that and it's not using calories particularly efficiently because it doesn't have to, right? Why would it when it has such abundance most of the time? And generally after a few days, that type of hunger tends to shift because our bodies and our minds have shifted to, okay, but I'm not in abundance mood right now. I'm in lack. And while that's hard, I get it. I have a new routine. I'm not going to get the food that I'm used to and that I want. So, all right, I'll adjust. The next stage in this is shifting into ketosis, where our body goes from burning blood sugar to burning fats by changing them into this thing called ketones, which it can then burn for energy. It's a totally different type of metabolism. And the shift into that can often be very hard on people's bodies, comes with a lot of symptoms that feel like you're getting sick or feel like you've got a stomach bug, diarrhea, nausea, fever even, weird taste in your mouth. It's a strange thing if you've never experienced it, but the more times you experience it, the less intense it is. So there's the habitual hunger, and then there's the shift into ketosis, which is hard. And then for a while, you generally feel better once you're in ketosis and you feel a lot less hungry because your metabolism is actually more efficient in ketosis. At some point, you're going to reach the point on alone, unless you've got big game, where you're not bringing enough calories of any kind, be it fat, protein, carbohydrate, what have you, to actually run your body and you're starting to burn up your body fat. So this can be uncomfortable. It's hard on your body. You're losing a lot of weight, but if you still have fat to give, then again, it's not that horrible a hunger and you tend to still have a lot of energy. Once you get to the point these people are in where they basically have no body fat left, we're starting to see the running out of gas, like Adam talked about, absolute full body drain that we're seeing in Timogen, where 
you just don't have it to give and it's affecting everything you do. Your body knows that it doesn't have the resources and it won't let you do the things that you used to do, right? Everything is slow motion. It's harder to think straight. It's harder to do basic tasks. Just getting water and keeping yourself hydrated is daunting. Getting up that small little rise to check your traps is a long process and it didn't used to be all of these things so this is what i'm going to say is deep visceral hunger and then when you reach the point where you've already been starting to break down your muscles and you're approaching potential organ damage it's a whole nother type of hunger it's what is danger hunger right your body really starting to tank and i experienced this in the arctic on season six where I wasn't getting enough food. I wasn't getting enough food the whole time, but I felt strong and energetic up into a point. And then I just had this strong sense that I was approaching the edge of a cliff. I was still going. I hadn't slowed down, but I was starting to feel the kinds of shift these guys were talking about and I had a very strong sense that I could go and go, but then I might just plunge over the end of that cliff, which was potentially major, major long-term damage. And this is what they told me, the doctors told me when I came out, they said, yeah, sometimes there are people like yourself who don't feel the effects of hunger, feel energetic and strong and feel like they're doing okay in their body and they will keep go, go, going until their heart stops. And that is why we were really, really concerned about you. So different levels of hunger, some your body can deal with, some are more uncomfortable than others and the deeper kinds tend not to be as uncomfortable as the early kinds ironically and then some where you start getting into loss of function and then into the serious danger zone we don't want to see anyone on loan going there really love people who are tracking their body well enough not to push themselves to that level and a shift towards getting out of here without long-term body damage that is the win that is success that's what I'm going for. Thanks so much for watching everyone. It's getting really exciting as we get down to the last group of folks, only two episodes left. What's gonna happen? And shortly after the conclusion of this season, the frozen season is gonna be starting. So, so much exciting stuff to talk about. Love sharing it with you all. I will see you next week.